Well, welcome back to our study of the fundamentals of operating systems based on the textbook Operating Systems Concepts, 10th edition, by Abraham Silbershots, Greg Gagne, and Peter Galvin, published by Wiley Publishing. In our last lesson, we were talking about the technique in a multi-programming system we learned that the first step is for the job scheduler to select a job to bring into the system where it is placed in the ready queue to wait its turn at the CPU. When its turn does come, its state changes from ready to running. We also learned that a job or a process is not allowed to keep the CPU indefinitely. As part of our discussion, we found that some jobs are CPU bound. If given the chance, these jobs might keep the CPU so long that other jobs will suffer. Other jobs are I.O. bound. These jobs will keep the CPU only long enough to ask for some other device. For example, the job might ask for the network device. So these jobs will give up the CPU voluntarily. So our running job is going to have to give up that CPU one way or the other. It might ask for that network device, in which case it's moved to a wait queue to wait its turn for that network. Or it might be finished, so it is terminated. In this case, the process control block will be deleted and all resources held by this job deallocated. It's also possible that the CPU scheduler has determined that it's been running long enough and pulls it back to the ready queue to give another job an opportunity. We also learned that whenever a job is removed from the CPU, its state must be saved, unless, of course, it's terminated. So let's continue where we left off in our last lesson. Switching the CPU core to another process requires performing a state save of the current process and a state restore of a different process. This task, as I told you, is known as a context switch. When a context switch occurs, the kernel saves the context of the old process in its process control block and loads the saved context of the new process scheduled to run. Context switch is absolutely overhead because this system does no useful work while it's doing a switch. Switching speeds vary from machine to machine depending upon the memory speed, the number of registers that must be copied, and the existence of special instructions. Context switch times are highly dependent on hardware. For instance, some processors provide multiple sets of registers. A context switch here simply requires changing the pointer to the current register set. Of course, if there are more active processes than there are register sets, the system copies data register to and from memory. Also, the more complex the operating system, the greater the amount of work that must be done during the context switch. Advanced memory management techniques may require that extra data be switched with each context. For example, the address space of the current process must be preserved as the space of the next task is prepared for use. How the address space is preserved and what amount of work is needed to preserve it depends on the memory management method of the operating system. The processes on most systems can execute concurrently. They may be created and deleted dynamically. These systems must provide a mechanism for creation and termination. During execution, a process may create several new processes. The creating process is called a parent process, and the new processes are called the children of that process. Each of these new processes may, in turn, create other processes, forming a tree of processes. Most operating systems, including Unix, Linux, and Windows, identify processes according to a unique process identifier, which is usually an integer number. 
The process identifier provides a unique value for each process in the system, and it can be used as an index to access various attributes of a process within the kernel. This image illustrates a typical process tree for the Linux operating system, showing the name of each process and its PID. In Linux, the term task is used instead of process. The system D process, which always has a PID of 1, serves as the root parent process for all user processes, and it's the first process created when the system boots. You remember our talking about that. Once the system has booted, or started, the systemd process creates more processes which provide additional services, such as web or print server, an SSH server, and so on. In this image, we see two children of systemd, logindd and sshd. The login D process or task is responsible for managing clients that directly log into the system. In this example, a client has logged on and is using the bash shell, which has been assigned a PID of 8416. You may remember that earlier we discussed command line shells such as the born shell. This is another common shell. Using the bash command line interface, this user has created the process ps, which is a utility that shows information about running processes. The user also created a process of the vim editor, which is a plain text editor that's often provided with Unix or Linux. VIM is a version of one of the earliest text editors in the Unix environment, VI. Just as a side note, looking at this slide, unlike Windows DOS, all Linux and Unix commands are case sensitive, which means that the VIM must be entered in all lower case. A capital VIM, for example, will not work. Neither will a capital PS. The user must input a lower case P and a lower case S. The SSHD process is responsible for managing clients that connect to the system using SSH, which is short for Secure Shell. SSH passes data across the network in an encrypted form. The earliest utility for a remote client was Telnet, which passed data in plain text. This meant that if one were logging into a remote system, his or her password would be clear as a bell in plain text, so that any of the bad guys out there might be able to read it. As I said, Unix and Linux systems allow the user to obtain a list of processes by using the ps command. For example, the command ps space dash el will list complete information for all processes currently active in the system. The dash el is a couple of parameters that the user has added to give further instructions about what is to be displayed and how. A process tree, like the one shown here, can be constructed by recursively tracing parent processes all the way back to the systemd process. Linux systems also provide the ps tree command which displays a tree of all processes in the system. In general, when a process creates a child process, that child process will need certain processes, such as CPU time, memory, files, I.O. devices, and so on, to accomplish its task. A child process may be able to obtain its resources directly from the operating system, or it may be constrained to a subset of resources of the parent process. The parent may have to partition its resources among its children, restricting a child process to a subset of a parent's resources prevents any process from overloading the system by creating too many child processes which, as we have already found, may spur the mid-level scheduler to bounce them out of the system and back to secondary storage. In addition to supplying various physical and logical resources, the parent process may pass along initialization data input to the child process. For example, consider a process whose function is to display the contents of a file on the screen of a terminal. 
let's say file hw1.c. The name hw1.c sounds like this is an uncompiled C program. When the process is created, it will get as an input from its parent process the name of the file, hw1.c. Using that file name, it will open the file and write the contents out. It may also get the name of the output device. Alternatively, some operating systems pass resources to the child processes. On such a system, the new process may get two open files, hw1.c and the terminal device. Remember when we said that Unix tends to treat devices like a file? And it may simply transfer the data between the two. When a process creates a new process, two possibilities for execution exist. One, the parent continues to execute concurrently with the children. Two, the parent waits until some or all of its children have terminated. There are also two address space possibility for the new processes. One, the child process is a duplicate of the parent process, meaning it has the same program and data as the parent. Or two, the child process has a new program loaded into it. In units, as we have seen, each process is identified by its process identifier, which is a unique integer. A new process is created by the fork system call. The new process consists of a copy of the address space of the original process. Essentially, the new process is a duplicate of the parent. This mechanism allows the parent process to communicate easily with its child process. Both processes, the parent and the child, continue execution at the instruction after the fork with one difference. The return code for the fork is zero for the new child process, whereas the non-zero process identifier of the child is returned to the parent. After a fork system call, one of the two processes typically uses the exec system call to replace the process's memory space with a new program. The exec system call loads a binary file into memory, destroying the memory image of the parent containing the exec system call, and starts its execution. In this manner, the two processes can communicate and then go their separate ways. The parent can then create more children, or if it has nothing else to do while the child runs, it can issue a wait system call to move itself off the ready queue until the termination for the child. Because the call to exec overlays the process's address space with a new program, exec does not return control unless an error occurs. We now have two different processes running copies of the same program. The only difference is that the value of the variable PID for the child process is zero, while that for the parent is an integer value greater than zero. Although, if one gave the PS command, one might find that the child and parent have been assigned the same PID. The child process inherits privileges and scheduling attributes from the parent, as well as certain resources such as open files. The parent waits for the child process to complete with the wait system call. When the child process completes by either implicitly or explicitly invoking the exit call, the parent resumes from the call to wait, where it completes using the exit system call. This is also shown in our figure. So we have seen that in a multiprocessing environment, not only are separate processes being brought into the system by the job scheduler, but these processes as they run may also be creating other processes. And those child processes and parent processes all need to be scheduled the same way by the CPU scheduler. So you can see it can, it, there's a lot going on with this operating system and this CPU scheduler. This was a lot to consume in one session, so why don't we take a break here. Look over your notes. Maybe back this thing up and take a look at that last diagram a little bit to kind of get a feel for what's going on with the child and the parent. 
So when you're ready, come on back and we will continue with this discussion.